Buongiorno a tutti. Um, I would first like to say congratulations, big congratulations to Carlo and the organising committee for the conference. It's such a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here um, sharing knowledge among many, many physiotherapy colleagues um, and I always love to speak with physiotherapy colleagues, so thank you. And it's also an incredible privilege for me to be presenting in this session with so many incredibly distinguished um, colleagues, physiotherapy colleagues. So thank you very much again for letting me um, be part of this session. My job today is to share a little bit of information about the other side of return to play. We, ha we know a lot, I think as physiotherapists, we work a lot with the physical side of rehabilitation and recovery and return to play. But there's also, as you all know, the mental side as well. And that's what I'd like to share today. So the question really is, is my injured athlete really ready to go back to sport? And so I'd like to cover these four points in the next roughly 30 minutes. And so the first thing is to look at what actually influences the return to play after an injury. And I think most of you will have a really good idea of what these things are. Then I think it's important to think about or to consider what actually is concerning these athletes the most, because that can give us some helpful clues. And then to look at how we can actually measure this. So I'd like to give you some suggestions for things that you might think about using that, that might help you understand the, where the athlete is in terms of their mental readiness. And then finally, how on earth do we deal with this in clinical practice? So I'd like to spend a little bit of time at the end discussing that with you as well. And you've seen this many, many times. I'd like to commend and thank all of the authors involved in this paper and to commend it to you. It's a free paper. You can type BJSM and 2016 consensus statement return to play into Google and this will be the first thing that comes up. You can download it for free. Really good resource that summarises a lot of what we're talking about today. And so the first thing when we, when we talk about return to play is to remember that just because we expect someone to go back to sport, it does not mean that they will automatically go back to sport. And it seems like a really simple thing, but I think often we fall into the, the trap, if you like, of projecting our expectations. So we have to take a step back and, and separate our expectations from the situation. And that's important because it can help us to understand why don't some of these athletes go back to sport after their injuries. And of course, if you don't have the physical function, if those tissues are not healed properly, of course that can be a really important reason why you don't go back to sport. And I'm, I'm not going to deal with, the, with those reasons because I think you, you understand those really well and we've covered those really well. What I would like to focus on from this figure that you've, you've already seen is the bit in the middle. So those psychological factors and some of the other contextual factors around return to sport because as you know there's a whole lot of stuff return to sport is a biopsychosocial thing we have a person we don't just have a, a, a ligament that's torn or a muscle that's torn we have a whole athlete to consider so if we think about some of the things that we can't really change and the reason you might think well why on earth is she putting this up here we can't do anything about them but it's important because this is the context that we're working in and it's really important that we understand we can we can have an athlete in front of us and already have some ideas about whether returned about the likelihood of return to sport so I'm sure that you've seen in clinical practice that young athletes are much more likely to go back to sport. Maybe you've noticed that the male athletes are more likely to go back. And certainly 
the higher the level that the athlete is at, the more likely they are to return. And if nothing else, there's a big financial incentive for an athlete who gets paid a lot of money to go back to their sport. That's their job. And so what I'd really like to focus on today and what, we'll, what I'll focus on for the rest of this discussion is the mental aspect. And these things, these factors are really important because we can potentially change them. And when we put all of the information that we have about these factors into statistical models, they show very big effects on returning to sport, both for the scale that we use to measure when the, the athlete is, is psychologically ready to go back to sport, and I'll share that scale with you in a little while, and also for the measure of fear of re-injury. So the athlete who has a lot of fear about going back to sport is much less likely to go back. The athlete who is more mentally ready to go back to sport is actually much more likely to go back. And to put this into context, this is the statistical summary of the, the hop test. So yes, the performance on a single leg hop test, so you stand there, you do one jump forward as far as you can, that does have a relationship to whether you go back to sport after an ACL injury. But that is such a small effect, and actually that effect is equivalent to a 3% difference between the injured leg and the non-injured leg. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I find it pretty difficult to just discriminate between 3% one leg to the other leg. So the point here is that in these psychological factors, we have a very big effect. And so I believe this is where we're, we're gonna get a lot more bang for our buck or value for money if we put some time and effort into addressing the psychological factors as well. So the mind really does matter when it comes to returning to play. And Mario made this point really nicely before. So the athlete who is more mentally ready to go back is more likely to go back. They return faster, but actually I think it's, it's more about more timely return to sport. So the coach that Phil talked about is really happy because the player is going back within a good time frame, not in an unsafe time frame, but in a, in a good time frame for what the coach is expecting. And most importantly, from the athlete's perspective, he or she feels like that return to sport is more successful for the performance. And as we saw from Phil's talk, the performance is, is critical for the coach but, and also for the athlete. That's what the athlete cares about. And this is illustrated really nicely by the case of Derek Rose, who had an ACL injury in the NBA a couple of years ago. And this is his journey, if you like, through the return to play. So the, the ACL injury and the surgery happened as you would expect, quite fast, and then had a typical rehabilitation period, was cleared to return to play. But this whole process from injury to returning to sport took about 18 months. And particularly in the US, they're really big on these time frames. And there's, it's almost like you can sell your physiotherapy practice by saying, I'll get you back in eight months. Well, I'll get you back in six months. Well, I can even do better and I'll get you back in four months. So the fact that Derek Rose, big NBA star, took 18 months to get back to sport after an ACL injury was a big deal. And for him, the biggest barrier to getting back on the court was not feeling confident about playing. So if someone of the calibre and the, with the team around him of Derek Rose has problems, then is it really any wonder that our recreational athletes also have problems or potentially have problems? 
I'd like to jump now and look at what concerns these injured athletes most. And so typically, I think if you ask any of your injured athletes, they walk into the clinic, they've never had an injury before, and you say to them, can you draw for me how you think your rehabilitation will go, they, they probably draw something that looks like this. So they think that it's just the injury gets better as you go with time, hopefully as fast as possible. But we all know that that doesn't usually happen. In reality, return to play and rehabilitation looks a lot more like this, where sometimes it goes fast, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it feels like the athlete's taking a backwards step or a couple of backwards steps. And so it's really important that we talk to athletes about this and set up realistic expectations for rehabilitation because that also feeds into the psychological readiness or the mental readiness to go back to sport. And the typical concerns that injured athletes have are around these three topics. So they're worried about whether they can perform again, whether they'll go back onto the court and look really stupid because they've lost all their skills, they can't execute the things that they did before. They can't keep up with the opposition like they could before. They get concerned about losing contact with their team or with their club because for most of these athletes, their, their social connections are all around their sport, particularly for young athletes. That's how they identify themselves as an athlete and all their friends play sport, play their sport. So they're worried about losing that and they're worried about that lack of support network. Injured athletes are also concerned about losing their ability to control the decision-making process, particularly around when they actually make that transition back to sport. So these are three really important things that we need to keep in mind when we're working with these injured players and injured athletes. And I'll share a couple of suggestions in a few slides about how we might address this in rehabilitation. But first I want to just address this point. So how on earth do we know if the injured athlete is ready to go back to sport from the mental side of things? From the physical side of things, we can do a test. We can get, see how high they can jump, how fast they can run, how symmetrical their strength is. But how do we test their, their confidence? And this is important because being, if they're not mentally ready to go back, there's a whole lot of risk involved. So it risks them being anxious about the performance. It also risks them being not, not being confident about going back. And we know that there is a relationship between people's fear or lack of confidence about getting a new injury and then actually getting an injury. So there is some relationship between your mental readiness or how, you, how confident you're feeling and the risk for getting a re-injury when you go back to sport. And so if you're working with athletes who have an ACL injury, this is absolutely the best questionnaire that we have to measure if the athlete is ready to go back from a, the, the confidence perspective. And I really like this, this questionnaire because it's short and it was designed specifically for athletes. A lot of the sports psychology questionnaires were not designed for athletes going back to sport. We need someone in Italy to do a, a translation. There's a lot of work going on in different parts of the world with this questionnaire, so I'd be very happy to see an, an Italian translation if we, can, if we can get one at some point. And the other thing is that if you are working in English language, this is available as an iPhone app. So you can give the, or an iPad app, you can give it to the, the athlete there in the clinic and get the results straight away. 
The other questionnaire that I think is, is worth considering is this injury psychological readiness to return to sports scale. This is a six question questionnaire for athletes of any sport with any injury. It's not, a specific, it's not specific to any sport or injury particularly. The, this has not been used so much, so we don't have a strong research to tell us whether it's a good questionnaire or a bad questionnaire, but it seems like there is some relationship between the answers on this questionnaire and going back to sport. So probably it gives us some useful information. So really, the crux and the most important bit is, what on earth do we do on Monday with our injured athletes? How do we deal with this psychological aspect? So if we think back to those three main concerns that athletes, injured athletes have, the first one was about competence. So this is about um, how they can actually perform. And the best thing we can do to help these athletes is to build their confidence and their self-efficacy, so their belief that they, they can actually do this. We can do that by good goal setting. We can do that by pairing them with an, with an athlete who's been through the rehabilitation before. So they can talk and they can, it's almost like the, the more experienced athlete can give advice. It's okay, you know, this, yeah, I remember feeling like it was really horrible in the beginning, but it got better. Keep going with it. Relaxation and mental practice, so actually visualising yourself doing playing sport or doing the skills in your sport can also be effective. The second concern that these athletes had was about relatedness. So remember, this is about losing, losing contact with people. And so here, we can help them stay in contact. So we can design rehabilitation content that, we can, that that athlete can do safely in the team training environment. We can get them in, in contact with their team, keep them there. We can talk with the coaches and see is there a role that this athlete can play in mentoring other athletes or maybe in coaching. And the third important concern was about being in control of the decision making. And so here, this is where we really need to focus on our shared decision making processes so that we share all of the information with athletes, not just the information that we think they should know, but all of the information, and allow the athlete to make an informed return to play decision. So we might feel a certain way, we might feel that the young athlete with the ACL injury should not go back to playing football, but that's not our decision. That's the athlete's decision. We can give the athlete all of the information about the risks and about the, the chance of osteoarthritis, but it's the athlete's decision in the end. So we need to be working together and communicating well. But we're not psychologists, we're physiotherapists. <laughs> and so, this is, this is not necessarily something that we get training for in our degrees. And so we're recognising this and we're actually, a big part of my job at the moment is developing a, a smartphone app to help with this. So we're actually putting a lot of these techniques into an app that the athletes can download to their phone and work through at their own pace alongside your really good physiotherapy. So we're not just, I'm not just standing here saying do this and it'll be wonderful. I'm, I'm giving you some or sharing some suggestions with you and also letting you know that this is, we recognise this is tough and, and we're working on it together. So to sum up, really quality rehabilitation involves a whole lot of stuff a whole lot of considerations. Definitely the physical function, but also the, the psychological function, 
we need to understand the tactical aspect, the social aspect, technical aspects involving coaches, and most certainly performance. So it's, it's a multifaceted approach to rehabilitation. So my three key take-home messages, the first one is that just because we expect a return to play does not automatically mean that the athlete will go back. The second thing is that the mind really does matter for return to play. So we absolutely need to consider that in our rehabilitation planning. And finally, multifaceted rehabilitation is, is going to give us quality rehabilitation. We can't just focus on one single thing. We can't just focus on that injured shoulder because that injured shoulder is connected to an athlete who is a person. And our shared decision-making approach will help us to bring some of these other aspects in together. Thank you very much.